Welcome everyone. Welcome to the sneak peek uh, tech radar webinar. Uh, I'm your host for today, Vanya, and uh, I would like to now get started. So first of all, a few logistics uh, announcements. Uh, it would be great if all of you can use the Q&A section to ask questions to our panelists. It helps us manage the questions better. Um, and uh, you can engage in chat, but if you ask any question in chat, it's likely difficult to answer because uh, the chat grows very quickly. So please feel free to ask your questions uh, in the Q&A section, and we will try our best to accommodate all the questions while we go along. And uh, yes, keep it engaging, keep it uh, interesting on the chat as well. And uh, without further ado, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, so I'm your host for today. My name is Vanya. I'm the head of tech for ThoughtWorks India. And now I invite uh, Barani to introduce himself. Barani. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Vanya. Hello, all. Barani Subramaniam. I'm also the head of tech of ThoughtWorks India. I pair with Vanya on this. Uh, along with uh, playing the role of head of tech, I'm also the member of what we call the tech advisory group, uh, the group that actually puts the radar together. Uh, super excited to be here. Thank you so much, Barani. Uh, James, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Vanya. Um, so, James Lewis, hey, I'm also, like Barani, a member of the ThoughtWorks uh, Technical Advisory Board, which is the group that advises our CTO. Um, I've been a member of that for about 10 years now, and I've been in ThoughtWorks coming up to 17 years, which I never thought I'd, I'd say, but it's it's <laughs> been a while. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be here and to talk to everyone today. Fantastic. Um, now let's take a look at uh, what Radar is about. So Radar is our opinionated feedback on technology. It's about tools, platforms, languages, and frameworks. And uh, it's important to understand that it's built bottoms up because ThoughtWorks is a global organization. We are present in more than 35 regions. And this this radar is built by collecting these feedback from the teams that are working across the globe, right? We work with a diversity of clients, we solve diverse problems, and all of these technology choices that we end up using successfully and end up evaluating do sometimes make their way into the radar. And now I'm going to give you a brief introduction about these rings. So ADOPT is a strong advice zone, right? We believe that this specific technology uh, is very good for adoption. It's it's a strong recommendation. And if your problem space matches the, the blip that we have had, uh, we recommend that you use that. For trial, uh, we believe that it's worth pursuing. The litmus test for trial is also that it has been used in production uh, at ThoughtWorks, but it's important that you definitely evaluate how is this technology going to impact your project? And if your project can handle the risk, we definitely recommend that you give it a go. Um, with regards to assess, um, it's it's likely that we might have used it in production, but it's not a mandatory uh, requisite for being an assess. So this it's possible that we have evaluated, and we believe that this specific technology has a great appetite. It shows great promise. So you can definitely explore this uh, with the goal of understanding how it might impact your enterprise. And withhold, we definitely say that you proceed with caution. We have had not so great experience with this technology or this option. And we believe that we should tread with caution as we you know, intend to use this for your enterprise. And without further ado, uh, we should move to the first blip. And I invite Barani to take this. Barani, all yours. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, uh, so the structure for the rest of the webinar is gonna be we picked few blips that we think is uh, interesting enough uh, to be discussed in the sneak peek. Um, so the first one is uh, Dragonfly. Um, so Dragonfly uh, is a new in-memory store, uh, like uh, which is compatible with both Redis and Memcached. Uh, so the thing with Dragonfly is that um, if you go to their website, that you will see uh, uh, interesting benchmarks claiming that they are like 3x faster or 5x faster than Redis. Uh, but that's not the reason we got excited. I think uh, there are two things uh, that is promising with Dragonfly, all right? Like the, the first one is that it's one of the 
newer frameworks to exploit the new IO urine uh, from Linux. So if you're not familiar, um, Linux has this new interface to do asynchronous IO that kind of addresses a lot of challenges that uh, currently exist uh, with async IO. So Dragonfly is built ground up to, to exploit this capability. On the second feature that I personally find it uh, quite interesting is that Dragonfly is multi-threaded and shared nothing. Um, so if you have used uh, Redist in the past, uh, Redis is pretty good at what it does, uh, but it's also single threaded. So if you if you want to like vertically scale up your instance and you want to get like, the most out of your multi-core machine, uh, then if you are using Redis, then you have to go for a Redis cluster, which could complicate your setup, right? Like you need to manage uh, the big instance, you need to partition your data and so on and so forth. Uh, but the Dragonfly is is pretty simple in that it's just a single process, but it's multi-threaded, so it can it can use all of your resources of your big machine. Uh, but that said, we still believe Redis is the default. Uh, so we we put Dragonfly in the assess ring, uh, meaning it is interesting enough for you to take a look, and and just don't go with the benchmarks. Try it in a in a few small projects and 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 learn from the experience. So Dragonfly in assess. Thank you, Barney. We can move to the next blip because we don't see any questions so far. People are still getting warmed up. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, James? Sure, yeah, thank you. So um, in this uh, issue, of in, in this volume of the radar, where we've, we've blipped uh, incremental developer platform. Um, now, Taking a step back, we've pretty much talked about it, talked about developer platforms in every edition of the radar going back several years now, um, and platforms are you know very much a hot topic. Um, but what we're seeing more and more actually is folks, uh, clients, or organisations that are adopting an approach to building a developer platform, which is more, much more sort of we'll build it and they'll come. So you know we're going to think about the idealised set of tools and platform or pl platform. Um, implementation that's, that our, our, our developers are going to need, our teams are going to need. We'll build it all and then hope people start to use it. Um, so what we're calling out with this is actually the best approach to, to, to developing a developer platform. Uh, uh, lots of use of the word developer there, but to, to, of, of building a developer platform is to actually uh, adopt the same approach that we would use when we're building uh, applications, which is to take a thin slice. Think about the most valuable thing we can deliver first and actually use things like you know, proper product management, uh, product ownership, uh, to guide the evolution of that platform then further. Um, this has been uh, written up uh, in, in quite a lot of detail in the brilliant book, Team Topologies. I recommend uh, you take a look at Team Topologies. Um, and in Team Topologies, they talk about you know this idea of the thinnest viable platform. So building out you know, just the just just the functionality that that you know a, a team might need, and then building on that. So whether that's even as starting as simply as delivering a set of documentation, and then set then delivering a set of templates, then offering self service APIs, as opposed to just jumping straight forward to um, a set of self service APIs. So that's why we're we're talking about this. Um, let's treat platform adoption and platform build in the same way that we treat uh, we treat other 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 app, you know. Software, software application builds um, and, and, and think about the thinnest viable thing first and build out incrementally from there. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, we can go to the next blip, uh, Barani. Okay, yeah. So this is uh, blip number 95 in languages and framework. It's called Connect. Uh, usually we will have quite a lot of entries in languages and framework with the, the number of JavaScript frameworks are there, but uh, this one is uh, pretty interesting. So it's it's an it's a family of libraries for you to build APIs for both browsers and uh, gRPC compatible backends. Um, so uh, another way to put it is that Connect claims itself to be a better gRPC, uh, right? So in the past. Um, we have been very cautious about gRPC because, uh, and James would add that we are a big fan of uh, building things clean, simple. Rest is pretty good, um, and and can get you get your job done. And you have a 
big ecosystem of tools uh, for you when you work with rest uh, uh, rest sorry uh, but the thing that connect uh, makes it interesting is that it has addressed a number of concerns that we thought uh, were existing uh, with grpc the first one being uh, if you build an api with grpc you needed a proxy uh, because the browsers didn't understand the grpc protocol uh, so you needed an envoy or some kind of a proxy to to connect grpc web uh, to talk to the backend uh, so connect address that so connect natively supports grpc web so you don't need a proxy in between uh, there is also another number of import, uh, improvements uh, behind connect one of them being Instead of implementing a custom HTTP server, uh, they actually implemented the whole framework on top of the, the native net HTTP from Go. So what this means is that you can mix and match your own middlewares or routers uh, if you embrace the framework, which is again, one of the pains if you have to adopt TRPC is that because it's built on custom uh, implementation, you can't use any other uh, routing if you go GRPC route. So in a nutshell, uh, we think Connect is a good attempt to address a few of the concerns that we had with RPC style uh, approach to building APIs. Um, so it is in a sense, it's, it's relatively new. I think um, there is a support for Go as a backend and they are also building TypeScript as an, another backend uh, uh, supported language for the framework. Um, currently you can use the Go backend and then consume it in the browser with their uh, Connect web. Uh, we, be, we believe it is interesting. Uh, so that's the reason why it doesn't assess. Great. Uh, I would like to remind our audience that uh, raising hand is not going to work here. So please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A section. And we will try to answer them best as we go along. Um, with that, let's move on to the next blip. Thank you, uh, James. Yeah, so this is XMART for build monitoring. So we've got a sort of long tradition on the radar really of, of blipping or, or, or identifying quite small, simple tools um, that solve a particular problem that we're seeing uh, as, <coughs> you know, in, in, in the now, in the moment, if you like. So XMART, I think, fits fits in this, in, in that sort of, in that sort of group. So, you know, it's, 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 it's for uh, Mac OS. It's a, a tool that allows you simply uh, to write scripts, which when executed will um, will show statuses in your uh, toolbar, essentially. Um, so it's a really, really simple application, but we're calling it a really, really simple tool, but we're calling it out here because it solves a particular problem, which has become prevalent now that we're all, or many of us are working, you know, remote first, uh, which is how do we know if our builds are broken? You know, traditionally we would have something like, um, you know, CC tray or cctray.net that we would use, which would you know poll um, our build our, our build servers, our continuous integration servers, um, and which would you know highlight the status of our builds over time. But the more modern um, build servers don't support the CC tray format anymore. So CC, CC tray two, I'm hoping. Our colleague will watch Eric Donenberg. will watch this uh, and will watch this webinar and, uh, and 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 finish writing CC Tray two. Um, but until he until he does that, Eric, um, we need some other way of actually understanding where our builds are because or, or what status our builds are, are in. I mean, and this is a, this is of course you know something that's an evolution really of 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 solving the problem of build monitors that we would normally have in our teams. You know, so if you think about an agile team, big visible big visible charts or making sure that everything's, um, you know, er everything is visible to the team at once so we can solve problems. Typically we would have a big monitor with 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 the build status on. Um, and when we're all sitting alone in our sheds, as as I am when I'm working working remotely, um, I don't have the the luxury of of a, of a build monitor. So something like XBar, there are other options available. I think Rumps is another one for Mac OS, but something like XBar that allows you to show the status of of, of the builds and then take action um, if we've got a broken build um, has become sort of uh, pretty 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 relevant and also very useful for our team. So um, take a look at it. It solves a very specific problem. It's a very specific tool to solve a very specific problem um obviously you can do more stuff with it you can you can you can 
do you know you can you can um, show all sorts of information with it um but you know if you if you if you need to monitor your builds you can use xbar to do it thank you uh james uh barani there's a question uh, for you is have you already answered that it seems <laughs> okay okay uh, do you want to do you want to talk about that as well uh, for our audience because this will not be uh, shown is connect performance better than grpc i don't think so connect is faster than grpc i think uh, because under the hood it uses the same proto buff um, but that said it's a new implementation so that could be some performance improvement uh, which is something we need to test and and find out but the the web side of it seems to be much smaller uh, because of the way it is getting built and it is a new implementation as well so it's not on the performance but on the other architectural things that they have addressed like the generated code is much more economical you can read it uh, so it doesn't look machine generated so all those features performance we need to test thank you um we can move on to the next clip it's you again right. so this one is mine as well thank you so mizu uh, we need to have something about kubernetes in a webinar um so mizu is an api traffic viewer for kubernetes um so we did this internal survey and we asked like the number of projects inside thoughtworks like uh, almost everyone is is using kubernetes in some form or another and then we asked them like do you use uh, service mesh or any kind of uh, like a proxy for uh, pod uh, the answer is not that much right like we found out under 10% uh, of projects you who use kubernetes use service mesh uh, so in case if you're not using service mesh uh, but you want to generally look at like what's my topology uh, look like in my kubernetes cluster uh, misu can answer that right uh, but even if you use a service mesh uh if you want to quickly view the traffic uh across all entities without instrumentation uh mesu is a very interesting tool um think of think of it like a tcp dump right like uh you can't tcp dump inside a pod unless you install something uh and 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 kubernetes makes it really difficult to do that so mesu solves that so one way to think about mesu is that because it is installed as a daemon set uh, it actually listens to the entire uh, the the pod network interface so even if you are using uh, an mpls uh, to to secure communication between pod to pod misu will see the unencrypted traffic because it is the same uh, interface your pod instance would listen on uh, so think of it as a debugging tool uh, so unlike so people do ask me is this something like a service mesh uh, definitely not it is just an observability tool um the best way to look at it as like a tcp dump or a wire shock and not like uh, a service mesh like istio or in more uh the good part about mizu is that it sits uh it doesn't sit on the data plane so in the sense so if you are debugging uh, production it will not stop Uh, or it will not slow down the processing of packets because it's just listening in the network interface and not in the part of your application data plane. So that's a good thing to do. Um, so that's why we put Mizu as one interesting uh, tool to assess in your Kubernetes ecosystem. Fantastic. Um, I I was hoping there would be a lot of questions around this because uh, Kubernetes is a love hate relationship for a lot of people around and. Uh, this is one interesting tool barani that you mentioned uh, so i urge our audience to please feel free to ask our experts our panelist more and more questions about uh, the rationale why we put these clips and how can we uh, get a different spin on them um okay there's a question uh, insistence works great uh, on miso it looks like it it's installed external to the cluster is that right it is it is actually installed in the cluster so it's it's installed as a daemon set so a, let's say you have a cluster of five nodes uh you would have if you install mizu you will have one instance running per node so in, in that sense it's it's inside the cluster not external all right great 
is is MISO just observability? Is is MISO just part of observability tools? Uh, we have a question from Vishwa Vijay uh, Barani. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the the product has evolved and they claim to do a lot more. The the part of the tool that we actually blepped is just the API uh, viewer, right? Like not as a serious observability tool like your open tracing or eager. Uh, so it is just as a quick way to know something is not working. Uh, and, and Mizu out of the box supports a number of protocols. So uh, is it between APIs or uh, you're sending a message to Kafka, something is not working or I'm sending a message to Redis. So we can view entire traffic uh, quickly and debug. So that's that's the use case for Mizu. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Parani. I think we can move on to the next blip, uh, James. Yeah, sure. So um, single page applications by default, which sits for me in, which is on hold here, and it sits to me in the bucket that I like to think of as us uh, occasionally saying naughty developers, uh, maybe you could do something differently. Um, so, so what we're trying to call out here is the fact that it, it, it seems now that there are almost entire generations of people who've grown up um, or have started working with uh, the web who um, by default, we'll start building single page applications, single page interfaces using React or Vue or whatever it is. Um, but there is a whole set of technologies out there um, that are you know, server side rendering technologies that also should be considered as well. So, you know, we're not suggesting that we need to go back to the late 90s, although, you know, I would be, you know, I'd have I'd have much darker hair if we went back to the late the late nineties and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a brown beard as opposed to a, a grey one, um, you know, and go back to server side Java re rendering, for example. But we are suggesting that you take a look at some other tools that have that are out there at the moment. So things like. Um, I think Hotwire is a, is a good example of, of, of a tool in this space, which allows you to do to do server side stuff. Um, and th there are many reasons for this. Um, you know, anecdotally, we've got you know stories from lots of our teams who are who, who you know who, who are building applications much much quicker when they're doing server side rendering. Um, it can be much much you know um, the logic can be um, written much much more quickly if you're doing it server side and don't have to consider all the complications of 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 of, of client side state management and um you know so on um also you know there are other a lot of other sort of benefits as well you don't have to start thinking about things like you know kind of search engine optimization in the client if you're doing it server side you don't have to have multiple different versions or um you know for that kind of thing so um so what we're sort of saying is you know think about when when we're thinking about building a web web application, think about whether we actually need to reach immediately for tools like React or Angular or Vue, whatever it is, and instead actually do the trade off analysis. Could we actually implement this using a set of server side uh, tools instead? Um, so that's why we've got Spa by default on hold. Naughty developers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, uh, again, a reminder. There is a hand raised, and I request Mark, please use the QA to ask your question. Um, yes, I think we can move on to the next blip. Right. BERT um, in techniques and trial. So we blipped BERT, I think, in 2019 uh, in assess. So BERT is bidirectional encoding representation for transformers. So it's one of those NLP pre-tained NLP models um, that Google initially open sourced. Um, so we put BERT in assess and, and we have used it in one pretty large engagement and which gave us the confidence to put it in trial this time. Um, so the point about BERT is that since we flipped in 2019, a number of pretty large models in NLP has emerged, including the, the famous GP, GPT-3. So the reason why we blip BERT now in 2022 is that we found it to be pretty effective for, for search implementations um, as opposed to the newer, shinier models, which are A, larger, or B, uh, slightly inaccessible to general public. Uh, BERT is pretty much well-documented. There's a lot of support. Uh, so if you have to tweak something, it's very well understood by the community. And that's the reason why we want to highlight that, yes, there are better, more accurate models out there, but BERT is still 
pretty effective uh, in the enterprise setup. And we wanted to highlight that um, if you have a need to do a custom search implementation and you want to use NLP for it, uh, BERT is still a good model for you. Great. Um, there's another question that has come in uh, for James for SPICE default. Do you think the tools in the React or Angular ecosystem will end up providing a server-side option that makes SPA versus server-side rendering a purely deployment time decision rather than a development time decision? That's that's a really good question, actually. I mean, I, 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 possibly. I'm not sure. I can't see the, you know, the the one thing you can be sure about predicting the future is that you're going to be wrong about the future, right? So, um, quite quite possibly. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's. I mean, it's interesting if I think about how the most successful uh, web apps that I've built over the years, um, they've tended to use. They've tended to use a bit of both, actually, right? So they've tended for various reasons, for things like performance reasons, right? We might, we might want to do things like, you know, cache content locally, um, but actually, you know, revert to server side rendering, um, you know, for 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 for, for, um, for um, you know first page load, for example, um, or you know the the old pattern which was. Um, you know, you have a single, this is in the book, The Art of Scalability, actually, which is a brilliant book if you've ever read that. It's a fantastic, fantastic sort of treatise on, on how to build um, scalable scalable systems. Um, but in that, you know, they, they talk about the idea that you have a single request, mainly you know, one request um, per, per application or per page, uh, which is the main content, then everything else is done um, lazily client side, for example. So, you know, there are, you know, we've, we've been doing sort of some combination of these things for a number of years for various reasons, including performance, including scalability. So, um, I'm not sure. I guess it's to watch this space. We'll, we'll take a look at, um, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll keep watching this over the next sort of couple of years or so, because, you know, I suspect, I suspect there are going to be a lot of gains from, the benefits you get from server-side development, you know, anecdotally, we've got teams talking about how it's twice that, you know, they're able to build things twice as quickly if they're doing it using server-side tooling as opposed to client-side. So, you know, it's, yeah, as I say, that's anecdotally, um, that's, you know, that's, 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 that's there's, there's no peer review on that. Like there's probably about an end of three teams I'm talking about. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's worth thinking about and worth realizing that those, those technologies or those techniques that you know that have been around for a long time now you know we can still use them um, and don't just have to jump into whatever's new and shiny you know and also you know it's kind of fun because you might learn you know we learning learning about new ways of doing stuff is also lots of what, what we should be about as technologists so if you haven't done that sort of stuff before um you know i think we should you know, all go back to struts too right and uh and all, all, do, all, do, all do it all do it suicide charter again <laughs> The tongue in cheek there. That's a joke, everyone. Just checking. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that, James. Uh, Struts. <laughs> All right. Uh, we can move to the next clip, please. Um, James. Yeah, that's me again. So, um, yeah, you know, I was I was in two minds about whether we should vote to put this on the radar, in a sense, because um, it's when we were in the meeting, we were sort of talking about this idea of path to production mapping. Um, as being something that that is incredibly common for thought workers and thought on thoughtworks projects to be doing. So this is the idea of trying to understand um, you know the the, the 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 value stream from concept to production. So I like Dan North's idea of um, the idea of you know leads time to the customer saying thank you. Daniel Tills North uh, sort of has that has that has that idea. So you know where, where do ideas come from and the value stream all the way through you know, to the different stages of the software development life cycle, and then through the different stages of build and, you know, artifacts, creation and deployment onto, you know, different environments. And then finally, you know, finally into production where, where, the, where, the, where, where the changes can um, presumably earn us some money or save some lives or, or achieve whatever they want. And so that's, that's what path to production mapping is, uh, taking it like a visual view of how long stuff takes, um, going from concept from soup to nuts, as my, my old, our old MD in the UK used to say. Um, the reason we were, and I was in two minds is because it's kind of our secret source, right? You know, you, you pay ThoughtWorks to come in and help you do all these, 
uh, things like understand how you can get better. That's what that's what you pay consultants to do. And this is one of the tools we use to do it. Um, usually it's based around, as I said, I mentioned, value stream mapping, creating value streams. Uh, another way I like to do this is by um, is by using the is by sort of uh, uh, maybe abusing um, the technique of event storming. So thinking about the different events that occur uh, in your software development lifecycle and mapping those things out, along with how long they take, along with how many people need to be involved, the different roles and so on. So why is this useful? Well, it's often when you visualize things like this, it's where you start to realize where your blockers are, it's where you start to realize where things like wait times can be reduced, or you can reduce things like batch sizes. Then we know from, you know, for example, um, you know, principles of product development flow that reducing batch size is you know the best way to increase cycle time. So by my, by mapping out your path to production uh, with you know, with 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 your teams um, with your team, you can often very quickly, very quickly see ways of optimizing uh, or, or, or ways of improving throughput or ways of removing blockers. Uh, so as I say, in two minds, because, you know, we need a toolbox <laughs> that we use when we come in to, uh, to advise our clients. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this is such a useful tool uh, that you can, you know, surface so much stuff, so many issues so quickly using it uh, that we thought it was worth, worth talking about more. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. It does remind me of the value stream mapping where we lay down all these steps and are able to identify where the leakage exactly is happening. So yes, secret sauce for ThoughtWorks, but now the world knows about it. Fantastic. Uh, I think with that, we have come to the end of our blips, but now we would like to move to another interesting section, which is about some of the themes that uh, we would like to talk about. Um, Barani? Yeah, so... I mean, similar to path to mapping path to production. We've gone back and forth on this theme um, for the reason that, you know, mobile development is not new. This is 2022. We've been doing this for over a decade now. Uh, but one thing to note is that, like, when it comes to modular uh, mobile development, it, in the projects that we have seen, we've seen a lot of clients struggle in this. Um, so in the past, we have put a number of techniques on, you know, how you organize your code uh, around the business domains, making business a first class thing. And then the team topologies go it further by saying, you know, have the teams around the domains as well. But when it comes to mobile, there is this inherent tension, right? Like you, you have the app stores and Android uh, play stores. Uh, you need to go through them so you can't make continuous, frequent, independent deployments like you do on your backend. But this tension in some way gets reflected in the way we organize code, in the way we organize teams in, when it comes to mobile development. And we want to highlight that this tension, even though it's it's real, like you can't go that often and deploy like three times a day to your, uh, three times a day to the app to your customers. But it does make sense to organize your teams and your code in a way that it is modular, all right? Like uh, it is common sense. Uh, in the past, we've had a number of tools uh, to help that we, we did blip a few tools like uh, uh, Atlas and Beehive from Alibaba. Uh, we did uh, talk about CocoaPods for the iOS ecosystem, but now you have Swift Package Manager that is natively supported. Um, and, and, and you have native support in Android as well. Um, so the tools have evolved, the frameworks have evolved, uh, but there is still this tension uh, when it comes to mobile is that, okay, everything is gonna be one big uh, monolith and modularity is, is pretty underrated um, right now. So this is the theme to highlight that, you know, it should be modular as well, pay attention to your mobile, uh, the way you organize your code and mobile development. Fantastic. Um, there's a longish question. Um, with new technology and programming languages evolve uh, to keep developers like us learning new stuff from the grounds up, will there be any unified programming language uh, or open standards in the future? And huh. there's another annotation on the same question, like common programming syntax and construct to make learning easy rather than learning a new language. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Someone I, told I, me this. Okay. Uh, go ahead, James. <laughs> oh, go, on, go on, Bronnie, please, after you. <laughs> uh, 
someone told us, I think it was Brandon, uh, the, the problem is always constant. I think uh, one way to answer this question is uh, rather than learning a new language or a new framework or a tool, uh, get yourself familiar with the problem space because that is more constant. Uh, I'm sure the languages are going to evolve. Uh, so there is no one thing to rule them all. Uh, we do talk about polyglot programming. Uh, so use the right language for the right uh, job at hand. But that said, uh, on the back end, we have seen this sort of standardization, right? Like you have LLVM as the common standard for most of the languages back end, at least the new languages. Uh, they don't want to reinvent the, the back end uh, or the compiler ecosystem and you have LLVM as the, as the target. So we've seen that converge. Uh, but you will always have like number of ways to express as a front end. So when I say front end, you have the languages, the Rust, the Golang, the TypeScript and Java of the world, and you will always have a, a domain specific languages to suit how you need. So I don't think so. We're going to have one true language. James. No, it just it just makes me um, think about that. Uh, you know, the, the thing about web standards. You know, you, well, we have a we have a, a we've got thirteen standards. Um, maybe we should we should create a standard to uh, uh, to unify them all. Now we've got fourteen standards. Brilliant. You know, um, <laughs> it's just an observation along those lines. Cool. Um, there are a few more questions, um, James, regarding the part production mapping. Um, Nahar Davidson is asking, are there any existing tools, services to help integrate this extremely necessary technique? How do you take all the different data points and put them together in a single pane of glass without building an in-house tool? That's a great question. It is a great question. It's um, So for me, the path, path of production mapping is, a, is an exercise that's run um, generally, what I would do is 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 get a team together for a, you know for a couple of sessions, a, a, a couple of hours each, um, and and run it as a sort of whiteboarding exercise. Um, the key to it, what I've found, is is this idea of accuracy over precision. You know, we're not trying to find exactly how long things take or exactly you know perfectly the process. What we're trying to understand is. In general, how do things look from you know from from idea through into production, and roughly how how long things take uh, in order to you know to, to, to populate the map? Um, so normally, what I would do you know is is just create. Uh, create an artifact maybe that's like even just photographs of whiteboards or maybe that's in something you know translated into something like uh, into a diagramming tool into mural or mirror afterwards um and 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 use that because you know the the i like gregor hope's uh observation that you know the reason whenever we create a an artifact on the development team or you know a diagram there should be a reason for it you know, we should always think about the purpose of the thing that we're trying to the artifact that we're creating and in this case the purpose of it is to identify uh things like bottlenecks to identify where we can improve our development processes where we can reduce you know that time to thank you so um you know, for me, there, there isn't there isn't a sort of um, a, a standard way of doing it. I would look at tools like event storming as a way of of, of approaching the problem. And I would look at tools like you know the idea of value stream mapping as a way of approaching the problem. Um, but then concentrate on, on what we're trying to get from the from the from the from the process, which is improvements in how we get stuff done, improvements in how we uh, we, we we improve our flow of of requirements into production. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to add on top of what James mentioned um, in the remote setup, as we all are right now due to the pandemic, tools like Mural and Miro are good alternatives to get a distributed team together to do such brainstorming exercises where the visibility is there for everybody and everybody can collaborate. So do take a look at Mural and Miro if you really want to do the mapping for your path to production uh, in a collaborative fashion. Um, this is another interesting question. Um, so in the last radar, I remember we did have some theme around low code, no code uh, in the last one or the, la or the one before that. There's another question that's come from Stuart and he's asking if there is anything in relation to low code tools or platforms in the current version of the radar that's upcoming. Uh, between Bharani and James, anybody, please feel free to take a stab on that. I can't think of anything, James. No, not off the top of my head. Um, we have, as you, as you, as you said, we've, we've had it in the past. We've had it in things like bounded 
low code or band, banded low code platforms and things or um you know using them in in a way that's uh, appropriate for your organization i think i think the, the issue or the, the so some of the some of the things we've seen over the years with low code platforms is they they promise the entire world and then you know they don't necessarily deliver the entire world um so you know using them in a in a way that's uh um that's that's using them for what they're good at and not using them for everything i think is our our, our, our general advice fantastic um there are a few very specific questions around hotwired and WebAssembly. i request our panelists to look at them in the chat if they would want to respond um, but there's an interesting question that has come up uh, have you tried mapping part to production directly in a project management tool like trello <laughs> that's an interesting one yeah, I mean, you know, that's essentially when we create card walls, you know, that's kind of what we're doing uh, in a sense is is creating a macro level view on path to production, um, you know, or, or the software development lifecycle, obviously. Uh, and, you know, this is this is why, you know, agile tooling is so useful, because you do get to see lots of you do get lots of rich information from card walls, right? You get to see things like when queues are backing up, you get to see where the bottlenecks are in your process and so on. Um, I've not seen the path to production done in, as in, you know, all the different stages of uh, of build pipelines uh, done in, in in a tool like Trello. Uh, myself, uh, that would be an interesting idea. I'm not sure how how you would do it though. Fair, fair. Uh, there is definitely a lot of interest around low code. No code. There are questions on do we use no code tool ourselves uh, or yourself i think james did cover some bits of that um, based on the context if the problem space matches um, the use of low code no code uh, why not and uh, there is an option about out systems yes that's one of the popular choices in the low code no code uh, space and uh, um, it's hard to comment on whether we recommend uh, that specific tool uh, just as yet but uh, please do watch out more as we go along all right, I think now it's our time to move to the next theme, James. Yeah, this this is um, this theme is about the power of platforms as a product, and it relates really to what I was saying earlier about incremental platforms building out building out platforms incrementally. I mean, it's 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 something we've been talking about on the on the tech radar for for a number of years now, you know. Um, but the thing that came up during during the meeting when we were in Barcelona several weeks ago now was the fact that platforms are no one really knows what a platform is anymore there are so many different types of platform that we talk about when we say platform is it a business platform is it more of a marketplace is it a developer experience platform is it an infrastructure as a service platform what are we actually talking about about platforms um, and once we disambiguate that and think about okay what do we want to use platforms for develop developer platforms for which is really about making other teams go faster right so the reason we want to build developer Developer platforms incrementally out is to enable the rest of the organization, the rest of our development teams in the organization, um, to improve their ability to get stuff done. Uh, and that that's really, you know, that's really what I think about when I think about platforms is this idea of teams that are teams that are building tooling um, to help other teams go faster. And that really should be the measure of their success. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, as as as, as we mentioned in one of the blips earlier, um, that you know, if you do this whole thing where you, you design the entire platform up front and then you know with no real thought about how it's going to be used or 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 or, or you know um you know just just go off and, and build it and hope people will come and use it often what we're seeing is a, a large investment by organizations uh for not much in the way of returns so so you know what what we're recommending or what the what the theme will, is is one of the themes in this radar is this idea of you know doubling down on product management doubling down on product ownership bringing the tooling that we use uh, as product owners and product managers to uh, to you know the rest of our of our business and the rest of the applications that the systems that we're building in, th in terms of things like usability testing user experience design and service design and so on and bringing that into into the world of platforms and developer experience platforms in particular to disambiguate um, that term so yeah that's the uh, that's that theme fantastic I think uh, that's about it. Uh, if you folks have more questions, 
please feel free to use the Q&A or even chat now because we can all look at it um, on the blips and the themes that we have discussed so far. Uh, I see that Bharani is answering one of the questions. Um, if there are more questions related to the blips and the themes. Okay, um, there is a question from Jonathan. Isn't building a slice of functionality for a platform a bit different to building a platform incrementally? What would you define as an increment? Is it just another way of saying to use a continuous delivery to get feedback? Shall I take that one? Yep, um, yep. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, yes, <laughs> I guess um, is yes and or yes but. Uh, I'd probably say uh, so. You know, it, so when we talk about thin slice, you know, we're we're talking about can we build a, a you know the the minimal viable set of features that are going to, that a developer team, development team, another team using the platform is going to find useful. And when we talk about you know incremental and iterative, what we're talking about is you know starting off with something that's simple and isn't necessarily full featured. So you can build a thin slice of I don't know. Let's say it's about. Uh, build and release tooling, right? You know, a, a start of a thin slice of build and release tooling might be a set of docs that explains the best way of, in this organization around here, how we're going to go about, you know, building and releasing the software. Then the second iteration of that might be a set of templates that you can use to create your own build pipelines, right, to run. And then another further iteration of that might be the ability, uh, you know, to use a, a platform provided continuous integration or continuous delivery, you know, uh, set of tooling. You know, so th there's a thin slice and also this ability to uh, develop incrementally once you know what people need and what people uh, find useful uh, based on, as I said, things like user research, based on pr proper product management, proper product ownership and so on. So, so uh, as I say, yes, yes and, I suppose. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, then another interesting insight and rather a question, platforms would cover not only tooling, but also the culture and the best practices to enable the teams to go faster. Um, there is an opinion there. Are, do we agree with that, uh, both James and Barani? Mm -hmm. I, I believe we do. Yes, uh, yeah. we do <laughs> believe culture and right practices around building a platform definitely go hand in hand with that uh, development of the platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go for it. Just, just one thing to highlight is that the word faster, you may not go faster when you're first adopting platform. It depends on your culture and which platform you're adopting, uh, but definitely more effective in the long run, right? Like that's that's one thing we've observed. Uh, so you would, you would see a lot of uh, a repetition or like uh, if you have to do it in a silos, right? You have to, the teams have to reinvent a lot of things over and over, uh, which on a platform we believe um, there is this tension between centralizing things in the platform and letting the teams innovate. I think that tension is pretty good and you make it visible. Uh, and the platform does that for you. So that, so it's more effective, may not be faster when you're adopting it first, uh, but in the long run, effective for sure. Great. Great. There's another question from James uh, Higgs. Do you think the rise of platforms is aligned with our often the switch from generalization to specialization in terms of engineering skills. That is the view of generalized platform aware devs and now shifting to specialized platform engineers. Um, I think there's maybe a part of that. I mean, the way the way I think, the way the, the reason I think it, that, 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 that they're being adopted is purely because it's really hard to scale people, right? So, you know, we've got a bunch of folk who are quite expensive. Uh, you know, software development or engineers or whatever, whoever they are. Uh, um, and, you know, the best way of scaling those is to offer tools in a way that they can you know, it's offer self-service tooling that allows them to get their job done without having to put a ticket into someone else who's also very expensive's queue, <laughs> essentially. So if I want to raise a ticket to get some, I don't know, my build pipelines created, or if I want to raise a ticket to get, you know, in the olden days, you know, kind of servers built for me and things like that you know that's going to introduce delays it's going to massively block the flow um of flow of work and also the people who are servicing those tickets the only way of improving their throughput is to increase the number of them right so you need to have lots and lots of people servicing tickets 
and those people are expensive and there's not that many of them. So way better to um, to solve that problem by flipping it and saying, let's make these things self-service and actually scale, you know, let's let, let's help, let's allow computers to scale and do that um, rather than have all these really expensive people scaling and doing it. Um, that's for me really the heart of why platform and platform adoption has been, um, is, is A, still such a hot topic and B, has as, as led to AWS and the other self-service cloud providers eating the world, so. Yeah. Um, there seems to be uh, quite a notion around the relevance of culture when we are building platforms. Uh, James, if you want to take this one as well. And Jonathan believes that uh, culture can be an issue if you require other teams to adopt a platform that is not correctly tied to their team's goals and visions, rightly so. Do you want to shed some light on this? This is a fantastic question again. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I think I think that's spot on, right? I mean, for, well, forcing anyone to use a set of tools that they don't that, that, that they don't find useful is going to be a recipe for disaster. I mean, um, one of our colleagues, uh, Max in the UK, Griffiths, he's he's done some tremendous work on on platform adoption in the sense of like how do you track over time as a product owner, you know, whether what you're delivering is successful you know by things like you know as you onboard new teams how easy is it for them to be onboarded what's their um you know almost like the mps the you know school as they're as they're used starting to use the tooling and as you bring more teams on on board over time you know um you know does their experience get better or does it get worse for example um so this is this this is i think what we mean by you know this idea of power of platforms as a product you know it, we don't we don't we don't these days most successful products aren't built and then you know people are forced to use them you know in the in the marketplace these days we use product product management to to, to build the things that people want to use and we need to be doing that with with with, with internal tooling as well thank you so much uh, james for answering that i'll request our audience to please keep the questions uh, in the purview of the blips and the radar themes um, for any other opinion, I think um, LinkedIn or getting in touch on Twitter would be a much better uh, way of getting any uh, input. Uh, there is a question from James Hegg. Uh, another one from me. Are you able to recall, share any stories where utilizing TVP has been all you have needed? Uh, I'm not sure what TVP is. Uh, do any of you folks understand what this question is about? <laughs> Uh, James, if you could clarify what TVP is, maybe we can try answering that. Thinnest Ooh. fiber. <laughs> All right, acronyms. Yes. Uh, and James Barani, if you want to shed some light on this as well. So, uh, like, um, no, is the is the short answer because I mean, that, I think the idea is that's where you start, right? It's it's the same with like um like a walking doing the idea of a walking skeleton, you know, when, when we're thinking about building starting off. A, you know, building out a software system. It's long been the idea that we we would build this like a walk-in skeleton, the simplest possible, you know, um, application that that you can that can be deployed all the way into production. Um, you know, that is that goes all the way through the stack from you know from front end through to through to through to storage or back end or whatever state management. And I think that's the same. It's the same sort of idea with, with this, right? You know, we're, we're going to be expecting to evolve that over time into something that's going to be useful. But what we're doing with the thinnest viable platform is saying, let's build that walking skeleton. Let's build the, the 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 smallest set of features that we can that we can build that will deliver some value. That will also, you know, but then we can also evolve it over time. So I mean, I think you know, I think the successful ones start that way and then evolve away from them. I, I don't think I've ever seen one which has ended up as just the thinnest, the thinnest slice, if you see what I mean. Yeah, if I want to add on top of that, uh, James, often uh, coupling your platform development with some product use case is the best way to go about it. Because uh, oftentimes, uh, as James has mentioned all, mostly I think several times that you build it and they will come, ideology has not worked, but you built it along with a use case that is important for your product teams, you build just those capabilities with your platform has been a fantastic approach and has worked well for almost all our uh, engagements where we have uh, taken our clients to the journey of building a platform uh, for their capabilities. So yeah, I think we are pretty much hitting the end of time. Uh, maybe we can take one last question if there is something interesting. All right, I think uh, that's about it. Uh, we aren't getting any questions related to the uh, radar Blips and themes. So I would like to thank 
everyone for being a fantastic audience. Thank our panelists for taking out the time, specifically James, because I know it's pretty early for him in London or in the UK. Um, so thank you everyone for being patient. And just so you know, the radar is going to be out on October 26th. So do stay tuned and watch out the space for more and more. And thanks everyone again for taking out the time and have a good day, everyone. Bye.